So, uh, got it. Uh, by means of introductions, uh, uh, my name is Brian Buck. I'm a geologist, uh, now retired, uh, living in Park City for the last 11 years and have been involved in the mining business for uh, my whole career and uh, am now sort of a, an amateur historian and student of the mining history of uh, Park City. And so I'm delighted to put these presentations together and share this information with you. And I see, Doug, you've joined. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Hi there, I'm, I'm Doug Ogilvie. I'm the president of the Empire Pass uh, Master Association. I've been 10 years in Park City. I originally came here to work for United Park City Mines and Talisker Corporation. And through quirks of uh, many different quirks, I uh, became responsible for this project. So Doug is one of our heroes. And uh, as the project manager for the actual raising of the Daily West head frame, uh, he, uh, he's a very important person. Steve Iswitz, who can't be with us tonight, uh, last year, well, up until recently, uh, was part of leadership of the Deer Valley Resort. And he was instrumental in the property transaction to acquire the, the uh, head frame property and then to work with the uh, Homeowners Association to uh, provide another piece of property that was owned by Deer Valley for the long-term uh, location of this head frame. So Steve is another one of our heroes. So um, with that, let's get started. The Daily West head frame is a steel structure that was built in 1914 over the Daily West mine shaft in Upper Empire Canyon. And as constructed, it was 85 feet tall and reportedly weighed over 80,000 pounds. It consisted of four main columns that you can see in this photograph. The two front columns were almost vertical and straddled the shaft opening that was located between them. The back columns were angled toward the hoisting works, which was located further back from the head frame. And then you can see various bracing members that cross between the main legs, you know, to stiffen the overall structure. It served the needs of the mining interest working in the extensive mines under Empire Canyon until all mining activity ceased in the 1980s. And after 2002, it was owned by the Jordanelle Special Services District to support their use of the drainage tunnels in the area that are sources of uh, local water supplies. And so during this time, the head frame was well known to the local community and visitors to Park City who valued it as an iconic symbol of Park City's mining past and part of the historical characteristics of the mountain land uh, in the area. And so uh, this photograph by Bill Tafuri uh, is what we were looking at for many years. Then on May 13th, 2015, the upper part of the Daily West mine shaft collapsed into itself, forming a crater 40 feet wide and 35 feet deep. The front legs of the head frame were undermined by this collapse and the entire structure tipped into the crater. Engineers and a contractor specializing in closing old mine openings were brought in by Jordanelle Special Service District to uh, uh, respond to this and to plug the shaft. Following approval of the plugging design by Park City, the first job was to lift the head frame out of the crater with two large cranes and then to move it off to the side. The crater was then filled with layers of structural foam, and you can see that uh, yellowish foamy stuff. Uh, that was placed into this crater first to uh, plug it. And then a, a layer of reinforced concrete and earth, and you can see that uh, culvert that sticks down through the plug, and that would allow uh, observations uh, down through the uh, plug into the shaft long term. And um, the top of that culvert was closed off with a protective grid, and the rest of the uh, uh, crater was filled with earth. And then the head frame was picked up again by cranes and placed back inside that fenced area. Uh, the JSSD property lying on its side. And this work was completed in the fall of uh, 2015. And that's how it remained. Uh, Jordanelle Special Service District made it clear 
They did not have plans to fix or re-erect the head frame on the property. In fact, the engineers who designed the plug for the shaft recommended against ever placing this heavy head frame back over that plugged shaft. And so this began discussions between multiple parties that what to do with the shaft property and the head frame. And JSSD made it known that they were interested in selling the property, which then raised questions among the stakeholders, what would eventually happen to the head frame? Sandra Morrison, then the director of the Park City Museum, along with the local historic preservation activist, Sally Elliott, and other community members made it clear their desire was for the head frame to be fixed and raised near the shaft site. And they held discussions with the city council, the city manager and staff to increase the city and political support for raising the Daily West head frame. Potential purchasers of the property were discouraged by the potential long-term liability from the shaft being located on this property. But Deer Valley Resort viewed the head frame as an iconic artifact of Park City's mining history and a unique ode to the legacy of these mountains deserving of preservation on site. And because it had experience living with other legacy mining sites within the resort boundaries of Deer Valley Resort, it was also more accepting of the liability from the shaft than other potential buyers. So in January of 2020, Deer Valley Resort purchased the surface rights to the property and took possession of the head frame and the hoisting works. At about the same time, the city and the Empire Pass Master Owners Association, represented by Doug here today, were working out plans for stabilizing abandoned mining structures within the boundary of the Empire Pass Flagstaff Annexation Agreement. The Daily West head frame was added to the Empire Pass 2020 Historic Preservation Plan, along with a preliminary scope of work and cost estimate. The Empire Pass Master Owners Association reached agreement with Park City where EPMOA took on the task of raising the head frame while sharing the project costs with the city. Deer Valley Resort granted permission to make the repairs and to erect the head frame on the plot of land they provided. Plans by the Homeowners Association and Deer Valley Resort were discussed with the Park City Planning Department and interested community stakeholders to get their input. The Park City Museum and its Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History Committee were particularly interested in supporting this project. Structural, civil, and geotechnical engineers were involved in the planning for raising the head frame. It became clear that a potentially suitable site away from the original shaft was located just about 100 feet uphill to the southwest at the former site of the mine substation. And the new site was on Deer Valley Resort property, which the resort then provided for the location of the restored head frame. And so now we'll talk a little bit about some of the engineering aspects of the project. I'm going to turn it over to Doug. And Doug, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Yep. So thank you, Bill. <laughs> Brian, you should say. So I, I apologize. I'm, I'm calling in from the parking lot outside City Hall. I have a planning commission meeting this evening. But uh, overall, you know, I had the, this is a very exciting project to have been involved with. I've been 30 years in the development business, and I think my, my parents would have been far more enthusiastic about this project than uh, pretty well any of the other projects I've done over the past 30 years. Um, I was fortunate uh, with this project to uh, get associated with Paul McMullen, who is a very pragmatic engineer in really taking on the task of how to take this mangled metal and turn it into uh, basically put it all back together again. The, we also, we part, partnered up with Rise Construction, a local steel fabricator who was fabricator erector who was fascinated by the, the challenge and the opportunities. So the, the three of us really worked together to figure out what could be done. The, as Brian previously said, we, you know, we first thing we had to do was find a a suitable site for it and the the former substation site provided the the sound structural foundation to build upon rather than the 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 site directly over the the shaft so if you look at the the slide in front of us the you know the bottom legs were 
seriously mangled when they were pushed down into the the crater as called it so ultimately there's a discussion as to what could we save from the structure versus what could we what should we you know replace there was some discussion about chopping the bottom 25 feet off because those the bottom four legs were so heavily mangled but ultimately we felt we had we had the ability to repair and the goal was to you know for steel members that could not be fixed to cut them out and replace them with like the so our, our structural evaluation included that we could remove these legs and repair them so we went on with that so let's flip to the next one brian so the back in 1914 if you look at your your building at 8500 feet with very limited uh you know capabilities the structure was basically built of built up membranes all with riveted construction so that you had individual structural steel components that were of a manageable size and overall there were you know hundreds of channels and plates thousands and thousands of hot rivets that were assembled above grade at, back in 1914 so the original construction is fascinating Can we flip forward brian i love these girders so this is basically a, a lattice construction so you can see you basically have two channels on each side and then uh, this intricate lattice that's all riveted together which is providing a a structurally strong member with really a, a very light weight which uh, worked with the, the constraints of the time so you've got two channels they're drilled you've got the diagonal web of steel strips it's very strong structures resistant to bending we could have replaced these with you know modern members but again the feeling was we wanted this to be uh, as authentic as possible so when, when we reconstructed these we reconstructed using structural steel bolts instead of the rivets but you know still maintaining the lattice construction the to carry on yeah so the so you can see here this is just one of the the many joints on the project so we're again we're we're using bolted construction for this but we also had uh, some welded but generally we had a lot of uh, bolted construction to replace the rivets the uh da -da 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 -da. moving forward so when our contractor moved to on site, a plan was made to remove and repair the most of the damaged structure. But the material was on the ground with all of the weight on the rest of the head frame overhead. Even with adding temporary stiffening structures, we could not safely remove all the material necessary with tons of steel structure overhead. So we, we brought in two large cranes to rotate the head frame so that the worst of the damage was on the top side. So you can see looking down on it, the uh, those are the those two legs on the bottom were the ones were the vertical members that went straight into the crater. So they were heav heavily mangled. You can see the girder between them is basically just bent, bent like aluminum foil. And then up in the air are the what were the back legs of the of the structure, and they were bent out, but not nearly as bad. So the the joints, you know, the, the worst of the joints is the the far one at the bottom. So you can see the what we were dealing with and going. How do we put this thing back together? The, ultimately, we went out there, we we surveyed the entire thing, you know, located it, rebuilt the geometry of it, and then tried to figure out how to go from there. The let's go forward one more. So this is um, and and kudos to the historical society and Bill for all the, the fantastic photography of of the work as this project went forward. So this is the process of the cranes lifting it up. And rotating it to 180 degrees so the the two more mangled legs were on the high side so the the crane rotated the head frame 90 degrees re-rigged again and then rotated it another 90 degrees so the front legs were now up in the air and great thought of just how mangled just how pushed in those two legs were. I think when it was lying on the ground, I didn't realize how initially just how bent it was. But as you as you started studying it more, you realized just the the impact of, of pushing that into the hole. 
So as the head frame was being turned around 180 degrees, the contract built wooden critting here to hold the head frame off the ground. The cranes lowered the structure onto the cribbing. This picture shows the degree of damage to the front of the head frame now, front head frame now up on top, caused by falling into the crate. You can see the, the cribbing by the, the guy in the yellow shirt, propping it off the ground so we could work in the Oh, we lost Doug. Let's just wait just a second, see if Doug can get back in. Yeah, he's not back in yet. So let me see what happens. Yeah. And if he doesn't come back, we'll carry on. Sounds good. Um, all right. So crew members began to attack the mutilated steel by supporting each member with a forklift as it was cut. We go forward. So this is, so in this section, great photography. So the, um, the main bird girder tying the two legs together, that was cut off and reconstructed completely. Then we cut out the joints, rebuilt the joints. The, so it was a, quite a project. The, Pieces cut out of the head frame were set aside for detailed inspection and repairs. Some of the main girders were shipped to a fab shop in Salt Lake City to be worked on while the rest of the crew continued working in the field. Um, so this is the worst of the- Hey Doug, the, this, is, this is slide 21 we're looking at right now. Cause you dropped out right. for a little while. The, so this is 21. Yep. So crew members were lit up to where the pieces were carefully cut out, keeping in mind some of the pieces needed to be reattached to the repaired structure later. The uh, next. Um, the pieces cut out of the uh, head frame were set aside for detailed inspection and repairs. Everything was you know, carefully marked where it came from. Some of the main girders were shipped to the fab shop in uh, Shop in Salt Lake City. We worked on while well, the rest of the crew continued work in the field. Next. So here you can see that the uh, those two front legs have been totally removed for work on offsite while we're uh, working on the lower legs um, in the field. With the worst damage cut out of the head frame, the crew went to work fixing the back legs that were now level with the ground. Some of the cross pieces that were damaged. Next one. Damaged sections of girders were carefully measured and cut out. This involved removal of hundreds of the original rivets. New steel channel matching the dimensions of the old was then welded in place. The old and lattice webbing was installed with bolts. Piece by piece, damaged members of the head frame were carefully rebuilt. Some, some guys working on one of the cross, cross members in front of you. Next. While work on the head frame proceeded, work on the new site for the head frame was started. The former substation site for the old mine and mill was a relatively level place just uphill from the shaft location. The site was leveled further and expanded by excavating into the hillside. Next. Lost Doug again. Okay, I'm looking for him. <laughs> Brian, I keep getting in and out here. And looking at the time, I'm uh, I'm kind of due to be heading over to Planning Commission right about now. Okay. Um, overall, I'd like to I'd like to give kudos to Sally and Sandra for uh, making this you know bringing enough attention onto the, uh, the historical structures out of up up Empire Pass to make this a reality. Uh, you know, big shout out to them. Uh, you know, shout out to City for uh, you know agreeing to participate with Empire Pass. The 
you know, this was originally not contemplated as something that Empire Pass should be involved in, but uh, you know, we firmly felt it was something that needed to be done. Um, so we had uh, a great team with Paul McMillan, the structural engineer, and Ben Hampton from uh, Rise Construction, who uh, Thanks, Doug. Have a good meeting. <laughs> uh, let's carry on. Um, so uh, the the equipment was brought. This is the, the 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 rough grading on the on the new site, and so the holes had to be dug for the future foundation. And uh, solid rock was encountered. Uh, requiring excavation with jackhammers. So you can see the gentleman there on the left-hand side with the orange uh, uh, hoodie on, and he's got a jackhammer beating away on the bedrock to try to make some progress. Um, on the uphill side of the new site, bedrock was encountered shallow. And so the piers uh, were formed right on top of the bedrock. And so you can see them forming up the uh, piers for the concrete uh, for the new uh, uh, head frame location. Now on the outer side, on the north side of that uh, uh, plot, uh, the piers had to be dug a lot deeper. And so you can see the height of the pier here as, uh, as they're finishing up the concrete work. So then concrete grade beams. And so you see these concrete beams that connect the four corners. Uh, they connected the, uh, the, different, uh, the four different footings. Uh, so it's all tied together in a reinforced concrete rigid structure to uh, permanently support the legs of that head frame uh, as solidly as possible. All right, so the parts of the head frame that Doug said had been shipped to uh, Park City for rebuilding were now completed and delivered back to the site. So you can see this is brand new steel, but they tried to preserve the design of these structures as best they could so that uh, they were preserving you know, the appearance of it for uh, its historical value. Well, uh, here you see sections of the front legs that were uh, repaired off site. Now they're bringing them back on site and now they're being attached to the rest of the structure. And so you can see the guys working up in the air um, to try to get those attached. Now they did a pretty good job. Everything it turned out to be uh, quite straight. So the head frame repairs were completed in uh, last fall, in the fall of 21. And we were looking forward to it being raised to that new site. Everything was ready to go and uh, in October. And we had an early snow, as you may remember, and uh, it shut the project down. And so that's the way the head frame looked uh, through the winter and uh, into this spring. And if you remember the former picture that we had with those mangled legs up in the air, you can now see how straight they are and, and how they've been uh, repaired very nicely. So this is the crew uh, of Rise Steel Construction that did the work in uh, uh, 2021, and they did all that steel work uh, to fix that thing. And so uh, kudos to them. Now, in June of, of this year, uh, we were again getting ready to uh, lift the head frame. And so Rise Steel Construction came back, worked with Wagstaff uh, uh, Cranes uh, Corporation to uh, pick it up. And what had to be done is because the head frame is uh, over a hundred years old and um, didn't want to do any more damage to the head frame by picking it up, uh, these lifting uh, structures were added to the top of the head frame. So you see, uh, here, the, the welder is adding this uh, heavy duty lifting dog to the top of that head frame. And then, uh, not all the way to the bottom, but uh, about a third of the way up from the bottom, uh, additional uh, lifting uh, uh, dogs, I call them dog ears, were uh, attached to the head frame again as locations for the cranes to, uh, to pick them up. And the, the concept of, uh, of this is they didn't want to just pick it up from the top and then drag the legs on the ground while they're picking it up because that could then damage the head frame again. So the idea here of attaching these uh, lifting points 
at the top and then towards the bottom is so that two cranes could simultaneously lift it straight up off the ground and then tilt it once it's up in the air. And so that would then reduce the potential for bending and damaging the head frame. So uh, the head frame was planned to be lifted to its final site uh, on June 30th, on, on that Thursday. And uh, it was advertised that way. People gathered at the montage to see it. Uh, but again, uh, weather delayed it. This time it was thunderstorms. And you can imagine how um, careful these crane operators are when you're the tallest steel thing in the neighborhood and there's uh, thunder and lightning anywhere in the neighborhood, uh, it's time to lower the cranes. And that's what happened to us on June 30th. Uh, they were ready to lift it. And uh, unfortunately the weather changed and a thunderstorm came in. So uh, we waited until the next day and that's Friday, July 1st. And when all was ready, these two uh, big cranes came and attached their lifting lines to those uh, lifting dogs that I just described. And you can see the two cranes doing that right there in that picture. So the two cranes then coordinated their lift and they carefully picked that head frame up, keeping it horizontal. And so now you can see that that uh, bottom horizontal uh, uh, member of the head frame is now uh, off the ground. It's up off the cribbing and it's, uh, it's a good 10 feet up in the air. And so these uh, two crane operators were coordinating their lift to, uh, to accomplish this. So once they had it up off the ground, the uh, yellow colored crane here, uh, the bigger crane, continued to slowly lift it up uh, and start to tilt it up while the smaller head frame kept the bottom legs up off the ground. So this was all happening up in the air. And uh, uh, I was there watching this. And while this was happening, there were the most unbelievable noises coming from that head frame. There were popping noises, groaning noises. It was not a happy thing. And, there, and then parts started to fall off of it. And it, all those sounds and to see some of these parts starting to fall off of it filled all of us with anxiety because what what's going to happen next to this poor thing? The, con the, the head frame, they continue to coordinate their lifts and they continue to tilt it up. And you can see now this thing is getting up uh, pretty tall. Keep in mind that the, from top to bottom, this thing is uh, 85 feet tall. Once the head frame was upright, the smaller crane then disconnected. And so the entire head frame was uh, hanging from the large uh, crane there, vertically. Then it swung it slowly from where it had been located uphill to that new site about 100 feet to the south of the, of the old location. And so it's, it was an amazing sight to uh, be there. And I took this photograph. It was an amazing sight to see uh, this uh, head frame flying through the air. So it was carefully lowered onto the concrete foundation of its new location. So you can see that it's still in the air, uh, but they're getting it close to fitting onto the footings of its, of its new location here. The back legs were lowered to the uh, footings first. And so in this photograph, it's hard to tell, but you see those angled back legs, the closer legs of the head frame uh, to us here are actually uh, uh, on the concrete. And so the concrete footings are taking weight. And then you can see the front legs are still quite a ways off the ground. And they're now gonna slowly lower those. But as you can imagine, you know, you've got to somehow tweak this thing so it fits precisely on top of the footings. And so when they lowered it, um, those back legs were now, there's friction there because they were now weighted onto that con their concrete footings. And the guys had to use these come-alongs to pull the whole structure laterally so that those front legs would be positioned correctly onto the footings that they're intended to, to uh, rest on. And then the front legs were lowered to the ground. And so in this photograph, you can then see um, 
after more than seven years sitting on its side, that the head frame uh, was once again uh, standing tall and the, uh, uh, on its new site. And the Empire Pass Master Owners Association will continue to provide the maintenance of this structure at that new site. Um, still to come is uh, fencing uh, at that new site uh, and also repairing the fencing at the uh, hoist location. Um, and then there will be interpretive signs uh, installed at both the uh, uh, head frame location and at the former shaft location and at the uh, hoist location. So as visitors come and see this, they can uh, you know, get a little bit better understanding as to what they're, what they're looking at. There's also a notion that there will be a roof placed over the uh, hoisting works uh, to help protect them a little bit from the weather. And so this is the, steel, the Rye Steel Construction Crew from this year. And, uh, and again, uh, excellent job, guys. So um, uh, thanks to everyone who has supported this project. Uh, Park City Municipal, uh, uh, Deer Valley Resort, of course, Empire Pass Master Owners Association, uh, Park City Museum, Friends of Ski Mountain Mining History, Rise Steel Construction, Wagstaff Crane Services, and Montage Deer Valley. And we appreciate everything that they all contributed. And anybody else out there who uh, uh, has also helped move this project along, thank you very much. So that is the end of my presentation. And I'm open for questions. So um, if, you have, if you have questions, you just have to unmute yourself. Um, Ellen asked, if the fence that will go up, will it be see-through? Uh, I think so. Um, there's been uh, a number of different design uh, considerations kicked around. And uh, I haven't been uh, privy to all of those details. Um, I think the idea is, is that, um, you know, we want people to be able to see these, these features and, and but at the same time, uh, keep people out from, you know, getting on the structures or doing any uh, damage to them. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, I, I think there's more work to do there as far as figuring out exactly the fencing, as far as I know. Um, another question by Catherine, is there some sort of lightning rod on the structure now that it is so tall? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, there never was a lightning rod on it. <laughs> and so um, whether that would be a, a, a good idea or not, um, I, I don't know. I mean, the whole structure is a lightning rod, um, but I don't know uh, whether the engineers are purposely grounding it because, you know, sitting up on those concrete footings right now. I don't know if that's a good enough ground or if they would need to do some additional grounding of it. Um, that's a great, that's a great question. I, sorry, I don't have the answer. Okay. Um, okay, there aren't any in the, the more in the chat. So if, it, if you'd like to unmute and you'd like to ask a question, please feel free. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for uh, tuning into the presentation. Uh, again, the recording of this will be on the museum uh, YouTube site. And uh, again, thanks to Doug for joining us and um, I hope you all have a chance to go up and visit the site once, once it's cleaned up and, and looks presentable uh, and go back up and enjoy the uh, head frame standing back up and, and uh, may it stand for another hundred years. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming everyone. We appreciate it. And we'll see you soon, hopefully at one of our other lectures. Thank you, Brian. You betcha, bye now. Bye-bye.